Hello everyone, uh, and thank you for coming uh, to this talk. Uh, so today I'm going to talk to you about a 700,000 line PR I had uh, the pleasure to work on, uh, and also how we worked on it and what does it mean uh, in terms of resilience of an open source community. Um, so first of all, my name is Anne Olivia. Uh, you can find me on Twitter. Um, I work in a company called UT7, uh, and uh, we are the developers. And I also co-organize PyLadies Paris. Um, I don't know how many of you know PyLadies, but it's a group that helps women uh, find a community. And we do Python, but we do a lot of things. And <laughs> I can see some fans in the back. Um, but uh, we do a lot of community work to help newcomers come into the Python community. And I also participate to open source projects as that, such as OpenFisca. So open as in open source and FISCA as taxes. Um, so for all the tax nerds out there, this talk is for you. So uh, one day, uh, it was, I think it was the morning, uh, I got to uh, open a, a new PR that uh, uh, arrived on OpenFisca. And I saw this very, very scary number. And I thought, first, uh, this is not possible. There must be a bug somewhere. And the reason I thought that is because the GitHub interface breaks uh, when you get to a certain number of files and lines change in a PR. So uh, if you add things up, it's uh, more than 750,000 lines changed. And there was six, more than 6,000 files to review. That is a lot of review. Um, and that was very scary at first, uh, but we soon realized that in that PR, there was an um, automatic test generator. So it, it really brought the, the numbers down, and that was very nice, because we only had 200,000 <laughs> lines to review now, uh, and only 1,000 files, so it was way less scary. So in the community, we started talking about it, and there were three types of reaction. And the first one was just, just merge everything. So that, that might seem weird. Um, but the reason is that the value of the PR was so large, so the PR would update the software, especially the tax system. So the income tax system, the French income tax system, would be completely updated with this PR. And when your software tries to simulate the tax system, having an updated tax system is actually of huge value. So some said, just, just merge everything. We'll deal with it later. And that would be, first it would be very quick. So that's a lot of work you, know, you can do on something else. Um, but also it would, um, it would make contributors very happy. Like, oh, you did a lot of work and we merged it and now you can use it. And, and so there was some uh, assets to it. But of course, it's a ticking time bomb because nobody reviewed that code. And so you can feel that someday you're going to regret that decision. Another type of reaction was just, just close it. Just who opens a 700,000 line PR? Just close it. It's just not, not OK. Um, and that, of course, would be very stressful for the person who opened that PR and did all that work. And there was this third type of reaction, which is, let's just call the contributor. Let's just pick up the phone and try to understand what happened. Um, and to understand the conversation that follows, I would like to talk to you a little bit about the OpenFisca project. So OpenFisca, the goal of OpenFisca is the idea that you can transform the law into code. So you can transform words that are procedural into Python code that is procedural. Um, and the I why would we want to do that? It's for several reasons. One, it's of course you can ask a computer then to run a bunch of simulation. But also it's a way to uh, use a procedural language to talk about procedures. So it means that it's clear 
because you have oper mathematical operation instead of words describing mathematical operations. So let's take an example. What, what does it look like when you transform the law into code? Um, let's take the idea of an income tax. Well, then you have a bunch of attributes that you're going to put on that income tax, like a value type or a definition period. Um, in France, a lot of salaries will be monthly based, for example, but it's not the case everywhere. You could have a salary that is week based, for example. Um, and then you have some kind of formula. Here, the formula would be, you take the salary of a person over a period of time and you multiply it by the tax rate on that period of time. And you can do that for everything in the tax and benefit system. Uh, and of course, if you, uh, if, you know, if you ever paid taxes in France or any country, you know that it's never that simple. Um, and uh, there are thousands and thousands of, um, of variables in Open Fisca France, for example, to calculate everything. So the idea of a tax benefit system is that you can not only simulate how much someone has to pay in taxes. So let's say that someone works as a playground designer and get a salary from that. Then that person is going to pay taxes on that salary. And let's say that person, for example, has a large family and get uh, benefits from that. That money is going to flow back. So you have really that system. And if you can simulate both, you get things that are really interesting because you can simulate the real life of that person's finances. So as a game designer friend said, it's like The Sims, but for real life. You get to simulate everybody's taxes. It's really fun. It's tax nerds. So an uh, example of what we can do actually uh, as uh, with simulators. So OpenFISCA is also used by researchers to um, to simulate uh, on large population how one change in the tax system could affect them. But on a personal level, um, there are two projects I'd like to talk to you about. MEZ, which uh, you can fill in all your information or anyone's, well, someone you are helping, for example, information, and they get to see which uh, benefit they can apply to and how much they could get from them. And uh, for example, another project is Lex Impact, which help activists and representatives understand how a change in the law could affect um, some typical profile of uh, families or people. Another thing to know about OpenFISCA is that it's in its core, it's an international project. So you have, the way it works is like a uh, computer, like a co game console with cartridge for different countries. So the console is the OpenFISCA core calculator. It's based on NumPy. And every country, pack, every country has its own package. So you have France and Tunisia and Uruguay and Italy and Senegal now. So many countries are coming into that system. Uh, and it's very interesting to see how uh, you, can, uh, you have to change the core sometimes because you don't think how other countries simulate their own system. Um, and not only is it international, but OpenFISCA is actually a, huge, it's a pretty big community of people working on taxes and on tech. So in its core, the OpenFISCA community is very diverse. You have people who are tech experts and people who are taxes experts working together. The more tech experts you have, the better software you have. You can make software that is easily uh, understandable, easily editable, and you can even create country packages that are um, more, or where the onboarding of new experts is easier and easier. And on the other hand, the more economic experts you have, the better use cases you have. And the, m the better your, your law is, uh, simulated because they know it. I mean, they know it so well. <laughs> it's uh, it's a pleasure to work with people who have this very deep understanding of the matter they're working on. And sometimes there are debates between the tech experts and the economic experts, and this debate can be on a variety of things, and that's what makes the 
community, a very interesting place to be because you have those conversations. But there is one thing we try to avoid as much as possible is for some part of the community to fork. I don't know how many of you know about what is forking, so I'm gonna pause a little to talk about it. So when you, when you fork in a community, basically is when you're at one point where uh, t two different groups are want something else, have a different vision of where the product should go. So they start moving away from each other. Uh, and for example, if you think, oh, my product should just, you know, let's say you're a dinosaur, uh, and maybe you think, oh, you know, there are not that much food on top, we should be lower to the ground, and another part of the, of the community says, no, we just sh should move somewhere else. Well then, once you're there, it's really hard to come back together. So if you fork, you separate your capacity of work, and you estrange yourself from very interesting expertise. So we try to avoid that as much as possible. And that's why we chose the third reaction, which is to give a call. To actually talk to the person and understand what their reasoning was in making that huge PR. So we talked and we agreed on a few uh, rules of engagement, <laughs> let's say. Um, the first thing we agree on is that we would meet and spend time together to work on that PR. And I think it's very important to not let someone be alone faced with a problem if they don't understand all, uh, all the reasons that it is uh, problematic. Uh, we agreed on review guidelines, meaning that we lowered the standard for a time. And I think that's very Im important sometimes to bring in new talent, to bring in new expertise, to think, how can I lower my standard for a time just so they can be onboarded and then work on upping those standards. And then finally, uh, something we understood is that as tech experts, we have uh, tools and we understand tools very well, such as Git and how, to how several people can work on one project, how you can use those, those very precise Git tools. Um, but it's not really easy for people who don't use Git like on a day-to-day -day basis to understand them. So two examples of things that are really useful for that contributor. Um, first, understand what a Git rebase is. Um, and when you rework on a PR, it's very, <laughs> very useful to know how to rebase. For those here who haven't rebased uh, a, a project yet, the idea is that you have a branch and an origin of that branch, and then you're gonna move that origin so that the, the you can have um, a, a branch that is very easy to merge. Like so. Like so. <laughs> the other tool that was very interesting to work, uh, to, to, to pass on, was a Git cherry pick. Um, for those who don't know what cherry picking is, is when you take a commit from a branch and you put it on another branch which is quite useful when you try to create a branch that has a coherent theme, for example, like so. <laughs> so let's say that the initial, the initial PR was dozens of commit one after the other. After working for one day uh, with the contributor and letting that person do their work and work on their PR to make it more accessible, this is what we got we got 15 different P coherent PRs that then were merged in a two month period. So we worked on this for two months and we merged it PR per PR. And after two months, our software was updated. Our contributor was happy because her work was, um, was, un uh, was merged and was um, valued. But it was not only this, because two months is actually a pretty short period, and we saw that that work had very interesting long-term consequences. The long-term consequence is that that contributor is now being, has this more technical expertise. So what they did is that little by little, they started, those standards that we lowered, then they started, their we st <laughs> sorry, we started to up them little by little, and um, she was committed to uh, to make that happen, and now all the all that code, for example, is thoroughly tested. 
Uh, the other thing that is very interesting is that now that person is teaching other person, other, other people who are contributors about those tools that we're talking about, about how to rebase, about how, how to make a good PR that is easy to review. And finally, that person is still trying to uh, be more expert in coding. So that economic expert is actually becoming quite a good Python developer as well. So we can see long-term effects. So why did it work? Why did that person take the bet that we could work together for months and merge that PR? Because one of the options they had was just to use their PR in their fork and just go on with their work. And the other question you might be asking is, how did I get her number? Because I said I was just giving her a call, but like, how do you call a contributor <laughs> when you work on an open source project? And the reason I had uh, that number and the reason that she took the bet is that we had put rituals, um, we had designed rituals around the community to get people closer together, to get them to know each other. And it was a conscious decision from the, co from the community. So we started having a newsletter every two weeks, uh, telling everyone what the up updates were, not only on the French uh, open fiscal packages, but also on international open fiscal packages. We started having um, after work uh, meetups where we would just talk about everything, about, about taxes, tax law, uh, because that's what we do on our off time. Um, <laughs> And I think one of the uh, best examples I have of how one after work, you know, a meetup can be very interesting is that I saw two contributors talk to each other and one was like, oh, you're at this and this on GitHub. And the other one was like, oh, and you're this handle on GitHub. Meaning that after this meetup, people were not just handles on GitHub, they actually had a name, they had a face, and they had a whole personality to go with any PR or any issues they would put in the project. We also had co-working sessions and road mapping workshops together. So why does this work? My belief is that when you do those things, you up the social capital inside your community. And so if you, it, the way I think about social capital is that it's the quality and momentum of the relationship that a community has with a variety of stakeholders. So it's about how you can use also that energy and that momentum and that quality to be resilient and to take on very hard technical challenges. So the reason you want to create that social capital inside your open source community is because it brings enthusiasm, because it's way easier to cooperate with people you know and people you have a relationship with, and also because it brings trust. And when you have very big technical challenges in front of you that is bigger than any one contributor, having trust is an essential part of a community. So how do you do that? Uh, a word I really like is conviviality, uh, mostly because it's attributed, the, 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 the origin is attributed to Bria Savarin, which is a, a Frenchman who has a, a cheese and a dessert named after him, which I think is the Frenchest thing ever. Uh, but conviviality uh, means to actually to eat together, to, to, to work on the fact that having this time together is going to be a very nice experience to e from anyone involved. There needs to be rituals, and rituals mean something you can look forward to, where you can have, again, a time that is um, uh, very, uh, you don't have to think about it too much and you know what's going to happen, so it doesn't take a lot of cognitive power to, uh, to think about it. And you need to have common myth. And I think this PR story is one of the common myths we have now in the open fiscal community. How, together, we merge a 700,000 line PR. So uh, now that you have social capital, how do you spend social capital? There are two ways to spend social capital. One is called bridging. 
And bridging means bringing in people from outside your community inside. Is creating those bridges to bring in diversity, to bring in new talent, to bring in more people. And the other way to spend social capital is bonding. Bonding meaning having stronger ties inside your community. And you really have to think how much of your social capital you spend on one and the other, and there needs to be a balance. So I don't know how many of you know about the OpenStreetMap project, um, but a few years ago, they had this project of, of drawing the lines around the 36,000 French cities. That is a huge technical challenge. And it took them six years to do it. And how do you keep that momentum going? Well, one of the ways they did it is that they created contributors events where people could meet up and spend time together. And they also have a yearly conference, such as we do in the Python community, uh, where p contributors get to meet each other and to talk about the things that really drive them, which is a lot of uh, OpenStreetMap contributors have a real passion for their work. So in conclusion, what does it mean for open source? It means that if you have a diverse community and you work on the conviviality of it, of how pl much pleasure and trust and cooperation there is in that community, then you will have a resilient open source project. Thank you very much.